This afternoon's event is all about learning how to capitalize on your talent and navigate the obstacles that we currently face in the workplace. The challenges are intense, a global pandemic, fierce competition, changing regulations, all further intensified by an increased demand for global talent. How has leadership faced these challenges? How can we challenge our underlying assumptions about workers and the workplace? How can we reimagine our operations for a more resilient and sustainable future? These questions have been the focus for today's guest, Johnny Taylor, and they're explored in his incredible new book, Reset, A Leader's Guide to Work in an age of upheaval. So in my home, it was always, we were oriented to focus on our natural strengths and then perfect those, get to the top of your game, as opposed to spending a disproportionate amount of energy to go from a C at something, i.e. athletics, to a B. What if we could actually make the workplace a great place? What if we didn't have to resort to, you know, the law to fix problems in the workplace if we could get in the front of it? What if we could actually get the most out of human beings, maximize their human potential? That would benefit the organizations. It would individually, the, not just the individual employees, but their families, their communities, society writ large. I really was thinking about that at a ripe old age of 25 years old. We have a major obligation to help people find out what they do well and then maximize your human potential. For all of us who thought, I'm going to go back to the way it was in March 20th, March 2020, those days are gone. Right. And, and especially in work, you know, okay. how people work, where they work, what is work, right? What's the balance between, and, and by the way, do we ever, ever, will we ever have work balance, work-life balance? Right. Think about it. We actually brought work into your home. That's if right. you think pre-pandemic, everyone was saying, how do I separate from work? I'm working all the time and I need to literally go home and leave that all along leave it alone. And guess what happened? We actually brought the work into our homes. In short, the book was about rethinking this thing totally, reset. Mm -hmm. Every assumption that you have made about how life operates has changed. And you will only be able to fully embrace it if you accept that reality. We in HR, if you really, really want to see your highest, you know, that holy grail of acceptance amongst all business leaders, it is to data-informed decisions that lead to action. If you do that, that's the 21st century way of practicing HR. And all of our data tells us that people worked harder over the last 18 months than, pr than prior to, and those companies have benefited from it. Efficiency going through the roof, productivity, all of that. But the what we did what we've largely underestimated is the toll that it's taken. And so we have not given people the opportunity to slow down. And even when you look at how employees, I've heard employees say, well, I'm not going to take a vacation because I've been working from home. So I've been on vacation. Well, no, right. no, you haven't. You've not been on not vacation. And so what we've learned is that long-term, we are literally changing the overall mental well-being of our society by not taking a moment to acknowledge that people are tired. Fatigue right. has set in. We as HR practitioners have to convince our other business leaders that you know you will hit a wall if you just keep pushing people and pushing people and, pushing, and it's manifesting itself in people leaving. They're just leaving without a job, right? We talk about the great uh, resignation and the turnover tsunami. A lot of people are just freaking exhausted. So what are you seeing that are the best practices that organizations are using, the organizations that you're working with and you've seen to help combat burnout and exhaustion, you know? So one, we talk about it and we destigmatize mental health, you know, people who have mental health challenges. That's number one. The second thing, just practically, and so that's important practically, but the second thing is I force my employees to take time off, periodic forced breaks. And the last thing, that we really have to do is educate our people managers. Our people managers are the problem. People don't quit companies. They quit their manager. Right. And if you have a manager that who is being rewarded for productivity and being rewarded for success and winning and all of that, they just drive and drive these horses. We, as HR practitioners, we've got to step up to a people manager and say, it's not your job to burn out your stars. I mean, that's right. not the goal. And yeah. you may not even be aware of it. And what, and so what, 
the undergraduate and graduate educators can do who are listening in is build a lot of uh, flexibility, adaptability, agility into your curriculum, into all of your pedagogy is you've got to help us because these folks, you, your, your product is your graduate. And then they come into the workplace. And if these folks can't do it and move with us and flex, and if they need hard rules, and they, then they become less effective for us. So the undergraduate and graduate program specifically, we need you to build those life skills, right? As I'd like you to focus a lot on helping, it would be helpful if you could help your young students understand, think a lot about who they are and what kind of culture they want to work in. We've worked so hard to focus on culture pre-pandemic. We finally had CEOs using that soft word culture and meaning it and committing to it. And then all of a sudden, uh, we have now divided the cultures. There's a culture of the people who work remotely and mm -hmm. then the people who are in the office. And I'm, I'm very concerned that that's hard. First of all, for the people who are working remotely, it's really hard to keep them in the loop. There's a reason the adage goes out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. Because that's just real. Yeah. If Johnny's in the office every day, interacting with people at the coffee machine, water cooler, da da da, building relationships, and Mary is at home behind a screen, she's at a disadvantage. So the number one challenge for us is to ensure that the people who are working remotely, Mary, John, Jill, Jack, whatever, that we find ways intentionally to bring them into the culture. So I do little things like, if you're gonna be on a Zoom meeting because you're working remotely, I'm gonna see you in the camera. Yeah. And we, we will send lunch. If we have a lunch, I'll send lunch, uh, DoorDash or Uber Eats or somebody, so that we're trying to replicate the human natural experience as best we can. If you are really committed to building one culture, then the one place that you can really deliver on that one culture is to bring everyone into the office periodically. The principles of strategic foresight suggest that leaders must look beyond data, uh, however critical, to connect with plausible futures. How do we do that in HR? I use data to inform my decision making not dispositive. So if the data says that, then I go run that way. Data informs our decisions, but doesn't make them for us. But that being said, when you're talking about the future, if you collected pure data, Henry Ford, who created the Ford company, right? The, so the saying goes, if he had asked people at that time, what do you want? When we were horse and buggies, we would have said more horses so that right. we could be faster. No one, the data would have never told you to build a car. Right. And that's the idea. So collect the data in the, from, from your employees. And then in some ways, you've got to take what they're saying, analyze it and really understand. So you don't want more horses, you want to go faster. You want and so glean from the data, what the future will look like. And Henry Ford said, the future is not more horses. It's an automobile that has horsepower. Social scientists like you can say, this is what they're really saying. Again, the example is, I don't want to work remotely. I want more flexibility. Well, that's a nuance of the same point, right? right? And then make good policy and start to think about what the future of work is based upon that. We have got to go to great lengths to be clear about our culture. You have got to get comfortable with what your culture is and then say it and live by it. There's nothing worse than recruiting, poaching someone from another organization with the promise of being X. And then when they get there, it's Y. And it's especially hard to do remotely. So with a lot of intentionality, make sure if you're the employer, you're in HR, that the prospective employee gets every opportunity to talk to a number of people. It's very efficient. Like mm -hmm. instead of moving around from office to office in an interview cycle, you can simply go from different screen to screen to screen and get people to see and talk to their future colleagues. So a lot more energy that you have, that you have to, to advance. To, to get the right person in the seat. How do, we, how do we change a corporate culture? As a senior management team, if you're sitting out here, practitioners, you put your folks in a room, the executives and say, let's be clear about who we are. Not who we wanna be, but who we actually are. The def so be crystal clear about that and articulate it. Secondly, after you as the HR practitioner, for example, have gotten your management to be real clear about what your culture is, you've now got to identify behaviors behaviors that support that culture, that are the things that if you do this, 
you will thrive in this culture. If you don't, you want, and you've got to articulate them with a lot of detail, right? And then finally, you've got to live it. Have you witnessed any shifts in the field of HR since the onset of the pandemic? The one is for the first time in my now 20, 25 years of HR practice, CEOs actually value HR. Here's the downside though, HR practitioners, because the bar has been raised, the mm-hmm. expectations have been raised. Right. A lot of us are not equipped and ready to step up. So what I've seen is increasingly CEOs saying, get ready. The HR function is important. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, right? right? I'm not so sure the HR people or my HR department is up for it. You talk about the power of the people who are often overlooked, such as applicants from minority groups, applicants with accessibility needs, applicants with criminal records. And in doing so, you pair your discussion of this talent loss with hardcore empirical data. What should organizations and recruiters be aware of with respect to these applicants? We know in the United States, as one example, 700,000 people are released from prison every year. That means there is a ripe group, potentially, and not for every job, but for certain roles that we could tap into that we have historically not done because we're busy resentencing them. The notion that we have decided that at 60 years old, people are on a downward uh, trajectory in their career. If it's true that the human being is now going to consistently live to 90, then you got at least 10 or 15 more years out of a 60-year-old. So those communities of people who've been untapped, who we've not thought about, are where we're missing at. Women, let me say this is my final. Mm-hmm. You know, we have so long allowed our own biases to come through about what are women's, what, what jobs can women do, uh, how women think, will they be more this or not that, all of the stereotypical behavior that has put in place barriers to women succeeding in the workplace to our detriment. Increasingly, the the academics um, are about stackable credentials. Mm-hmm. It's about, yes, we want people to attain, obtain college degrees. And there's no question, I'm a huge advocate. I've done it three times. My daughter's right. going to go. So I'm with it. I'm not anti-college. But in the process, there are a number of jobs that don't require formal education in the traditional sense. Sure. And we have got to open the doors to questioning whether or not we should go outside of some of these, um, our preconceived notions about who's qualified and who's not.